it is a uni Unitarian principle of long standing that the pulpit is a free pulpit. And by the same token, it's also true that the congregation, the parishioners, are people of free minds. And if you take those two things and put them together with a free message, you have some serious reinforcement and sustainability, uh, to say nothing of beauty and wonder. My reading this morning is entitled Religion, and in that sense, it refers to our congregational commitments. Nothing more and nothing less. Let religion be, us, be to us life and joy. Let it be a voice of renewing challenge to the best we have and may be. Let it be a call to generous action. Let religion be to us a dissatisfaction with things that are, which bids us serve more eagerly the true and right. Let it be the sorrow that opens for us the way of sympathy, understanding, and service to suffering humanity. Let religion be to us the wonder and lure of that which is only partly known and understood. And I that glories in nature's majesty and beauty, and a heart that rejoices in deeds of kindness and of courage. Let religion be to us security and serenity because of its truth and beauty and because of the enduring worth and power of the loyalties which it engenders. Let it be to us hope and purpose and a discovering of opportunities to express our best through daily tasks. Religion uniting us with all that is admirable in human beings everywhere, holding before our eyes a prospect of the better life for humankind, which each of us may help happen. You are the future, the red sky before sunrise or the fields of time. You are the cock's crow when night is done. You are the dew and the bells of maidens, maiden, stranger, mother, death. You create yourself in ever-changing shapes that rise from the stuff of our days, unsung, unmourned, and undescribed like a forest we never knew. You are the deep innerness of all things, the last word that can never be spoken. To each of us, you reveal yourself differently to the ship as coastline, to the shore as a ship. Amen. Well, good morning again. You've certainly heard people say what a valuable life's goal might be, just to start out at the top of all of our aspirations, to know the answer to what that could be. To do what we can with each day to make the world a better place, even if just a little bit. This is, of course, the Jewish tikkun olam that Betty has told us about before. And I thank her for the pronunciation. Repairing the world, a never-ending and yet absolutely necessary task. Having a goal can be a way of being for us. It can orient us. It can give us direction. But moving forward from there, that can be tough. Getting it done, especially the everyday part, meaning or no meaning, we all struggle. What I want, today, what I want to say today is that you can step back from your everyday repairing the world and see that we all struggle because we are all doing something incredibly tough. In trying to do it, we can find meaning even when we don't seem to have it in us to make the world better. So here's the way. Katie and I saw a movie some time back, maybe seven years ago or so, entitled The Way. It's about a man who's in his 60s, an ophthalmologist, divorced, who searches for life and meaning by playing golf with some buddies, apparently for the sake of making lame jokes and lamer shots. He's, he's Tom 
played by Martin Sheen. And Tom has a 39-year-old son, Daniel, who's played by Martin's son in real life, Emilio Estevez. Emilio wrote and directed the movie, so he got to direct his father. That's one kind of convolution or inversion there. Dun dun. There will be another. The movie is mostly about Tom, the father. Early on, Tom and Daniel, his son, talk as Tom is driving him to the airport. Daniel's going to France to walk the pathway from France over the Pyrenees to Santiago, Spain. El Camino de Santiago, a distance of about 500 miles. Tom, the father, obviously thinks Daniel's wasting his life and in the car on the way to the airport, Tom laments that Daniel has so many times, has had so many times to choose to do something. And Daniel responds a bit wearily but with much self-possession that one doesn't choose a life, one lives it. They lapse into silence, they've done this before, and there's nothing more to be said. Next we see Tom playing golf, nothing wrong with that. Uh, going round and round in his life, uh, sort of a pun on that, but Tom gets a call on his cell while on the green from a policeman in France who tells Tom that Daniel has been killed, that he has died in a storm. Tom goes to France, identifies his son's body, receives his belongings, and retreats to his hotel room. He's beside himself with grief. He doesn't know where to turn. Here then is the second inversion. The father who must grieve his son's death. That it is an unnatural arrangement only amplifies and makes more poignant what follows. Tom looks through Daniel's hiking gear, his large backpack, his tent, his clothing, anything to hang on to, anything to get closer to him. Daniel's dead and Tom wants to get closer. He looks at the guidebook Daniel had brought about the way, the path. He had planned to walk about what it means to become a pilgrino, a pilgrim. His son is gone and Tom's life, its future, swings before him as from a thread. It is one of those moments we have all had, one where we are indeed faced with pushing ahead into scary, unknown territory, if only because the life we do know, where we've been for so long, is irreversibly and completely closed off to us. It's not a choice. There is a sort of leap here, a seismic shift from Tom's old life, one where the old rules of how he had lived where the formalities that he had used to form a sort of makeshift shelter for himself fell away, and one where it seems that the rest of the movie can now be seen. We, we who are in the theater, we know what Tom will do even before he does. And more importantly, I think we know why he will do it long before he does. He is reacting now to his grief. He is doing what he can. He is doing all that is left to him to do. And in doing that, he is taking a chance on having a life that he can live. He will become a pilgrim. He will see what has always been there to be seen. That we are all pilgrims in all the times of our lives. That we all suffer. That our fellow walkers are all we have. That the journey we are on is what gives our lives meaning. And that if we pay attention we can find many reasons to be grateful to be along. Our gratitude for these simple things can overwhelm our grief. This is not easy for Tom. He's too focused on his regrets. There is his grief front and center. And then the walk is arduous. There is boredom, doubt, albeit some companionship, and conversation with the three other pilgrims he falls in with ultimately who come together primarily because they happen to be there. Not chosen, but just living their lives close in time, close on the way to where Tom happens to be. They make the best of all the messiness that goes with being human and what they make is good. What they make is genuine. What they make is a religion. What they make is not spiritual in the sense that they are moved by solitude or sunsets. They find meaning in their being together, 
in the sacred conversation that moves them along in the presence of the relics of others having passed the same way. On this, let me say a bit more. Tom leaves some of his son's ashes here and there along the way, and it occurs to me as I'm writing this sermon why he sprinkled them where he did. He sprinkled them on the artifacts, the human-made tracery and icons and crosses and piles of stones put up by other pilgrims and necklaces hung by other pilgrims over fence posts. He sprinkled them where he saw that others had come along before, feeling as he did now, feeling his way along, being human, stopping, frustrated, but getting back up, encouraged again to be able to keep on going from where he had stopped, being grateful to stay on the way, not having to deal with the rules of, or formalities about how fast he must travel, or who puts first, or whether stopping was unfair to others, or whether he might have to go back and tee off all over again. He sprinkled the ashes so his son could live the life others had lived. And in doing that, we see Tom living the life he had never seen himself living before. It takes him a while to get there. But when he does, it is this stepping back and seeing himself as a fellow pilgrim that is the beginning for Tom of religion. The Latin roots of the word religion tell us that it means to bind up again, to tie things together as one might join things together engaged in a common purpose, a common task, in a, in a community. The pilgrims discuss why they are on the walk and the reasons the one they are willing to share, the ones they are able to share, are surprisingly mundane. To overcome writer's block, to get in shape, to lose weight, to quit smoking. Tom finally sees, indeed all in his group finally see, that a real community is there for them. That their religion is not about the various ways that people describe their own particular religious affections. Tom recognizes that each has left behind something that says, I came by here too, just before you. You're on the same road. We are bound together in this sameness, our identity between you and me, our lives together. They have meaning precisely because we know the journey ends at Santiago. Let me finish this way. The movie, The Way, came out, as I said, about seven years ago. What it means to me now is well, it's suggested in a scene from another movie, one from 1974, Mel Brooks's Young Frankenstein. <laughs> I'm looking for the look on Katie's face about this here. This is always a secret. <laughs> and in that movie, there's a scene where Gene Wilder as Herr Dr. Frankenstein Steen, yes, I know, at the beginning, yes, exactly. He, I don't think he's become Frankenstein yet, or Frankenstein yet, that's right. I am, he says. And uh, Marty Feldman as Igor. Uh, they are unearthing a coffin, and they are somehow under it, lifting it up out of the hole they've just dug, and Gene Wilder laments, what a filthy job. And Igor says, I don't know, could be worse. How? And Igor, as if to give a real answer, says, it could be raining. <laughs> and of course, it begins to pour. <laughs> this is the problem with looking back with a too great focus on regret. The more we look back, the more it pours. One can see how what you did wrong has led when you look back, one can see how what you did wrong has led so inevitably to where you are now, to being drenched, less secure, less happy than you would otherwise have been. Wherever this inevitability comes from, 
I think we ought to put it to some better use. If you hadn't made the mistake, would your life then have moved forward in time to now, to your new life without downpours? Or would things have happened in between? Maybe more mistakes, more regrets. You are a free will being. You make choices. They can't all be right. But when we look back to a regret, a regret we un inevitably think somehow that had we not done that, had we not suffered that trial or that tribulation, then it would have just been all green pastures from there to now. We, we rewrite our life without knowing it when we focus too much on a regret. You make choices, they can't all be right. You would inevitably have later made a new mistake. One to be regretted anew. The right word here is unavoidability. Mistakes are unavoidable. What can be avoided, what can be avoided, is giving them too much rain. Oh, that's a pun, too, I see now. I didn't, I didn't, didn't see that at the beginning. <laughs> so, don't rue your regrets. Learn from them. They are great learning devices, I've been told. Sure. Yeah. But when you, like Tom, probably not like, like Dr. Frankenstein, when you look back, do this. Amplify your gratitude. Make a list each day, if you must, of all the simple things for which you are grateful. And then, drum roll for Martha, choose, choose with your free will to give them, to give this list of gratitudes inside you a really big voice. Let that voice be your new attitude. Let it vote for your gratitudes. And let it overwhelm the regrets. With Katie's help, I want you to know I've road tested this idea. And it really works. It really works. I think that's a line out of another movie. Uh, and so, what I've said today to you uh, has been said to you from my heart. Again, thank you for having us Amen.